Harvey from NABS. Um, thrilled to be here today with our friends from POCAM and Allison with their presentation today. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Julian Franklin. He is president of the Franklin Management Group, a strategic planning sponsorship and activation consultancy. And he's a founding member of POCAM, um, People of Color in Advertising and Marketing, an association that advocates for the inclusion and advancement of BIPOC people in the marketing industry in Canada. And he is going to introduce Allison to us right now. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, pleasure to be on the call or the video chat with everyone this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Allison Hill, uh, who is a fantastic uh, public speaker, uh, community activist, leader, and uh, someone who basically is bringing uh, joy and passion and love to all that she's doing to her community and many more. So uh, we're thrilled to have her uh, come and speak to us today. Uh, just a quick note for, for anyone who is um, unfamiliar with POCAM, uh, as Louise had said, uh, we are here to uh, support the voice and vision of uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the marketing and advertising industry. We're pleased to uh, partner with uh, Louise and NABS Canada on what we hope is uh, the first of many uh, collaborations together. So uh, sit back and enjoy um, the presentation from Allison. Allison, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. I would like to hire you to maybe come <laughs> to all of my speaking engagements and introduce me. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, I see that I see what we've got some mics off and some cameras off. That is okay with me, but today is an interactive sort of conversation. So I've built in a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, we're going to be using the tool Mentimeter today. Um, I was speaking earlier about how to access it and it's just by pointing your camera at the QR code and that will come up on your phone screen. In addition, I'd love to hear from you in the chat box if that is a way that you would like to communicate or you can raise your hand and use your actual voice. I love that as well. Okay, let's go to our next slide, please. Okay, so let's just, I just wanna know who's in the room. <laughs> I wanna know the vibe, the energy. Let me know what your zodiac sign is. <laughs> okay, we got some Virgos, Libras, Aries, Cancers, Aquarius, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, okay, a little bit more v Virgos. Okay, we got some Capricorns. Okay, okay, so it looks like this is like, it's giving a lot of Virgo energy in here today. Perfect, I love me some Virgos. Okay, let's go to our next slide, please. I also need to know um, who I'm dealing with here. Uh, is this a coffee or a tea group? That's coffees. I know you folks are into marketing, so it's giving a lot of coffee. <laughs> okay, we got some coffee. We got one tea, one tea. I understand that. I understand that vibe. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Are we a cookies and chips type of group? <laughs> okay, cookies are in the lead. Oh, no, chips. Chips are making a comeback. Okay, chips. So we're dealing with a little bit more salty. Salty than sweet. Okay, amazing. Let's go to our next slide, please. Uh, we are going to start out with a little bit of information about who I am, what I do, and the reason that we're even here today. So Shelka, can you play the video for us? Restore is a verb that suggests it's time to come back, to rebuild and reinvent, to honor what was, to reclaim your power, and put that power into action, to give that power to hope, love, joy, your health, to use that power to restore yourself 
and your community. It will take work to restore. Good thing you're ready. All right, let's go to our next slide, please. Okay, so first things first. If you've read my bio or you've heard anything about me, you might be thinking, what is a hairstylist doing in the wellness industry? Well, if you have a hairstylist or barber that you could not get to over the pandemic, then you probably have a deeper sense of how important and meaningful a stylist is to your self-care. So what is unique about a Black woman's interaction with the salon industry is that historically, we are taught that certain textures are good and other hair textures are not. So if you've got natural, tight, super curly, or spongy textures, you're pretty much out of luck. And any Black woman will tell you stories of either being encouraged or judged to wear straight hairstyles. And we also have a deep understanding of how we have to change to attract less attention and to blend in in the workplace. Now, as a professional, I can attest to the lack of educational resources, tools, products, and understanding of Afro textures for professionals and consumers alike, resulting in a culture that reinforces the notion that we have to be different to be here. Now, if one has to sort through those tropes, for their entire childhood, it can complicate their relationship with their hair and also their understanding of their self-image. So that is why I was excited to start Hill Studio back in 2016. From the very beginning, our approach has always been giving Black women an equally beautiful and empowering experience. So it's no surprise that over the past six years of conversations, I've realized that some of the same disparities that are prevalent in the salon industry can also be found in the wellness industry as well. Causing me to ponder, where does a Black woman go to be well? Our motto, good energy, good hair, isn't just about getting your hair done. Black women come to Hill to be well. Next slide, please. Okay, so our motto consists of two parts. We've got the good energy part, that's the wellness initiatives. We've got Hill Insider, Restore, Hill Run Club, more on that later. And then we have Good Hair, which is Hill Studio Salon. We started our salon community and over the past six years, we have applied the principles of community building and wellness to transform our clientele into a force. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're here today talking about the pandemic shift. And if I hear the word pandemic one more time, <laughs> I personally uh, want to throw up. But how does one shift around the pandemic without losing their footing? That's what I want to talk about today because. Last year or the past couple of years, it was a pandemic, but we don't know what's coming in the future. And what the pandemic did was give us an opportunity to really look at what's important to us and try to find the lanes um, where we can flourish in that. So I believe that what we did at Hill Studio was keeping and making sure that our values were clear. So I'm just gonna go over some of our values really quickly here. We got hope. Hope is the game changer, okay? Because hope is a bridge over doubt. Hope, having hope fills us with the energy that can be cultivated towards our goals. Hope is a companion to courage and progress. Now, if you feel like you've got any hope in your life or heart, let me get some hearts there. You see in the chat, are you a hopeful person? We're getting a yay and nay. Ooh. Okay, we're getting some hearts. <laughs> okay. The next one we've got is health. Okay, because health is the real bag here. There's only two things that you carry throughout your entire life. Those two things are your mind and your body. All right. Our next, our next value is the community. And that's our ecosystem. The community, we believe is the way forward. We believe that we have the resources within our communities to solve our problems. And then joy, my personal favorite, 
because we all want it and we all deserve it. Joy isn't just something that you have to wait on to arrive, okay? Joy is an option that is always on the table. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that you know some of my values, I'd love to hear from the room, what are some of the things that you really value? And you can use the chat box, you can use the Mentimeter slide, it's up to you. Engagement, huh. okay, I like that one. Honesty, joy, peace, community, partnerships, love, stories, courage. Well, these are good ones. I might need to add these to my, to my values as well. Rest, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, beautiful, I like that. Okay, let's go to our next slide, please. Okay. So this, this is one that I want you to think about for a moment here. The values that you mentioned before, are they reflected in the work that you're doing? You've got an, I feel aligned with my values, maybe for the most part, and then a not at all. Okay. I see, okay, we got uh, some for the most parts aligned. Okay, we're getting a reduction of for the most part. Okay, let's go to our, let's go to our next slide. Now, are your values reflected in the way that you approach your work. Are you giving yourself the same grace that you are putting into the work that you're doing? If you are encouraging folks to rest, are you restful? If you're encouraging love, are you showing love? Peace, are you peaceful? <laughs> Is it peaceful to approach you? <laughs> okay, I'm seeing for the most part. For the most part's in the lead. Okay, so there's always some room there. Beautiful, let's go to our next slide. Next slide, please. I think we might be a little stuck here. All right, so I'm gonna break down a little bit of how I kept my values in front of me during this time and during the the billions of pivots that I had to come up with. I feel like I pivoted to every angle possible over the past couple of years, but um, through that turmoil, this is kind of how I kept my footing. So hope, we teach our minds to choose hope through challenging ourselves despite our limiting beliefs. Hence, strengthening our outcome for a happy life. Let's go to our next slide. Okay, do you guys remember, do you remember this, this chunk of the pandemic? <laughs> uh, we went through a pandemic, but we also went through the largest global uprising of our generation so far. After the murder of George Floyd and BLM protests across the world, wellness practitioners who were also reeling from layoffs and uncertainty sprung into action to offer care for the devastating physical and psychological tolls that we were experiencing at work. Next slide, please. So if you, I, don't, I mean, I know it's a little bit traumatic, but if you can take yourself back to that time, 
where we were having different discussions at work, where we were seeing it on the news and in social media, I would like to know, did the pandemic and the civil unrest alter your approach to your work? Okay. Made some changes. I'm on a new path. Mm -hmm. it means you probably saw some things you really, really didn't like. Okay. So we were in fact impacted. I'm on a new path. Okay. Beautiful. Let's go to our next slide. Okay, so I want us to uh, share here of the work that you do, what, what problem are you looking to solve? We know what your values are and we know perhaps why you even took the job, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what problem are you solving? Access and equality and opportunity for racialized and marginalized folks in the marketing space. I like that one. How to be a part of change without being the one always calling for that change to be made. That right there, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Looking to have more faces like mine in positions of power and influence. Beautiful. Beautiful. What else we got? Actively make everyone welcome, safe, celebrated, and seen. Creating more uplifting spaces through curated music. Oh, I like that. I'll leave one more minute here. Okay, looks like we're ready to go. Now, let's talk about my problem. <laughs> okay, so my why is simple. And it brings me back, the pandemic brought me back to my original problem. Now, during the pandemic, um, the main thing that I was doing was running my salon. Uh, the salon was busy, it was filled with stylists. I was booked out months in advance. Some might say I was having quite a good time. <laughs> and then when everything closed down and I didn't have the ability to make money or interact with my clients in the same way, I really had to think about what my actual why was and how I could get back on track and get back to the essence of the work that I was actually doing. So my why is simple and the pandemic brought me back to my original problem. Where does a Black woman go to be well? After we experienced everything that we saw in the news and saw in real life um, and were experiencing in our own lives, where were those same women going to be well during the pandemic? From mental health to body representation to safety, Black folks experience wellness in ways that are unique and nuanced. And creating Black spaces in wellness for us and by us is vital for us to be seen. It's where we find safety, comfort, and community. Next slide, please. So 
which lands me on community here, our ecosystem. We believe in creating spaces that give us opportunities to explore our identities, explore our ideas, and our cultural practices in relation to our well being. Next slide, please. And if you can play this video. So since 2019, before we even knew the pandemic was coming, we've been transforming Hill Studio Salon into an event space and collaborating with Black wellness entrepreneurs. Due to systemic issues, Black women often do not have the financial access or opportunities to create wellness businesses and, and hence are excluded from the wellness narrative. We wanted to adjust that by offering our space for free by sharing markets, building networks, and finding opportunities to be well. A study conducted by the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Fund found that Black entrepreneurs are less likely to have access to financial support, but we still love doing the work. And Black women entrepreneurs see their contributions as culturally important to their communities. Next slide, please. Okay, so enter Restore. In response to the pandemic, we took the same women from the Hill Insider community and we built a Black practitioner team that is now leading the way in holding critical discussions around anti-Black racism in Toronto. And sometimes to our own consequence. This team is led by Black counselors, therapists, trauma-informed yoga instructors, and our clinics are designed to support participants experiencing issues related to systemic racism. Much of what POCAM does and much of what NAPS does as well. Taking care of the folks that are experiencing stress and trauma at work. Next slide, please. Through Restore, we work with your organization to develop meaningful, unique programs that focus on practical tools to restore awareness and prioritize healthy practices. Counseling and therapy are expensive and unattainable for many. We partner with organizations so that Black folks can access culturally sensitive wellness resources for free. In 2020, we facilitated over 135 virtual classes. We offered free summer courses paid through by donations, and we have served over 2,500 people during this time. Can you play the video, please? Hi. <laughs> Hi. So let's talk about this wellness series that you've set up for black women. And this is even before the pandemic started, before all the protests yeah. and the political discussion. So talk to me about what you were thinking and how it's changed over the course of the past few weeks. This is really important. Um, this was a really important portion of how we pivoted during this time. Because what we were find, what I was finding is that during that time, I was reaching out to some of the same wellness practitioners that I had been working with before. Many of them had lost their jobs, had to close down their yoga studios, couldn't do things in person and anymore. And nobody was coming to save us. <laughs> like It just was what it was. Um, you could perhaps get some CERB um, if it was available to you. But it was really a time where people had to readjust their like their entire way they approach that their work and one of the things that I knew how to do was to organize and to empower people and because this was within my value system and because we had already started genuinely building the network what I did was I reached out to organizations and I said here is this team right 
let them in, let them talk to your staff about what they are actually experiencing right now. And we created a platform for those practitioners to go in and offer their services in a different way. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk health. Health is the real bag, okay? Because there's truly only things you carry with you throughout your whole life, just two things. It's your mind and it's your body. Your friends don't get to come, your mom doesn't get to come, your kids don't get to come, your job changes, your school changes, your life changes. So the only thing that you really get to carry is your mind and your body. And if you're not taking care of those things, then they impact each segment of your life in a different way. At Hill, we know that health of these are paramount to the quality of our lives. And we wanted to make sure that we were offering services that supported our community during this time. Next slide, please. Okay, so enter Hill Run Club. <laughs> In 2021, we launched Hill Run Club, a body positive, culturally sensitive beginners run club for Black women. Since 2001, we have over 300 women registered for this club. Women who have not run before, women who are afraid to get into these communities, women who may have been working from home, who may have been working in their track pants for the last two years, who may have put on weight or had to um, deal with like emotional trauma. We created a space where they could come together and not just work out, but talk to each other, laugh, smile, and have a good time. We do weekly group runs. We visit and run city parks, participate in active TO. We hold sponsored educational sessions, and we create space where people feel safe, seen, and well. Next slide, please. Joy, my absolute favorite. At Hill, we don't just wait for joyful moments. We create them because we all want it and we all deserve it. Joy isn't just something that you have to wait on to arrive. Joy is a choice. Joy is an option that is always on the table. Let's go to our next slide, please. And can you play our video? Uh, that was the kickoff that we did just a couple of months ago where over 60 women showed up to run in person. Imagine. <laughs> At first, truly, when I started the run club, well, I personally started running during the pandemic. I am very new to running as well. All the gyms were closed um, and there was really nothing else that I could do. Uh, we also weren't allowed to go outside or do anything fun. So I thought, okay, this is how I'm going to power up. This is how I'm going to spend time in my mind. This is how I'm going to meditate. This is how I'm going to re-energize. And during that process, I would share it on social media and women would reach out to me and say like, what shoes are you wearing? How far did you go today? What bra are you wearing? What brands are plus size? Like, how can I get into this? How can I activate um, and have some of the energy that you seem to be getting out of this experience? And then I started thinking like, wow, like I'm, again, I, this is not something that I'm alone in. And perhaps people are looking for community so that they could start as well. So while I was running, I would just think about like, what would it be like to have my clients running with me? What would it be like to open up a space where beginner Black women runners who didn't have necessarily the same body types as everybody or who didn't look like a typical runner could feel safe to do so? And hence, uh, Hill Run Club was born. 
Okay, so I would say that joy, and if we can go to our next slide, and finding joy during this time, despite everything that was going on, is what I'm going to keep from the past couple of years. I would like to hear from you. What would you like to keep? And Joanna, yes, definitely come and run with us. Okay, I see a commitment to self-care. I see health. Mm -hmm. My community, taking time to slow down. Commitment to speaking up and having boundaries. Yes. The new relationship that I have through the pandemic, these new relationships that I have through the pandemic. Actually, I have a lot of new friends through the pandemic as well. That's a good one. Okay, the key learnings and teaching and conversations that took place during the pandemic. Don't want to lose the momentum. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Looks good. Well, we didn't come out of this empty handed for sure. Okay, let's go to our next slide, please. Oh, look, I've got one. There was another mindfulness and commitment to kindness. I like that. Okay, let's go to our next slide. It's your turn. If you got any questions for me or anybody in the room, really, let it rip. You can unmic yourself. If you'd like to do it anonymously, you can do it through the chat. I have a question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Hi, Allison. It's Julian here. Um, this has been amazing. <clears throat> question I have is, you know, through the journey to date, like, like, have there been more ro more uh, doors open or more roadblocks? Um, mm. And I'd be interested in kind of hearing how, you know, uh, if there have been roadblocks, how our communities and others can help. Um, so, mm. yeah. Okay, so I think, I think what I saw was a lot of doors opening. I did see a lot of doors opening because I felt like during that time, folks were kind of forced to have conversations that they didn't have before. And a lot of the issues that we were dealing with were not new, you know, like the work-life balance that we were experiencing or not experiencing at work wasn't a new thing, right? Racism at work, um, being passed over for positions, microaggressions, none of that stuff was new, but it was almost like there was like a crack that made us actually talk about it. Mm. Um, and during that time, I saw a lot of people step forward um, and put their, throw their voice into the ring. And somebody mentioned before about, you know, wanting to be a part of the change, but not always having to be the one to start it. And what I would say is that during that time, the people that I saw who were really putting themselves out there within their organizations many of them had to deal with pretty harsh consequences. So although they were encouraged to share their experiences, encouraged to um, talk about what was happening to them, it still didn't necessarily end up well for them. <laughs> so although it opened up, if you're not speaking to um, an audience or an organization that's prepared to make those changes, um, it can become very performative. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a good time for people to see like, really like, am I working with an organization that aligns with my values? Am I doing work that I actually care about um, that aligns with my values? Because now my patience is extra thin. <laughs> like I don't have it anymore because of everything else that's going on. So does this actually work for me? So I would say there's pros and cons too, as far as doors opening. Um, I do think, think that there were many people and a few organizations as well and people within those organizations that were ready to make the changes. Um, and through that time, I did see a lot of opportunity in that space. Um, some of the roadblocks 
that I experienced were a little bit more um, covert, I would say. Uh, not as obvious around what was going on as far as somebody might encourage you to speak up or, you know, say what's important to you. And then later on, you're getting snuffed or you lose your job or your boss doesn't talk to you anymore. <laughs> so while it opened space, it actually made um, a lot of places, it actually put a target on a lot of people's backs who were saying like, I need to, I need to change this space. I need to work on this environment. This doesn't balance out with like how my life actually works anymore. So yeah, pros and cons. I think it kind of comes down to people. I think we have a way of like saying a whole organization is one way or another, but sometimes an organization is one way and then you speak to the right person and they get you through because of how their values are aligned with yours. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated experience to navigate through some of those things. My advantage is that I am self-employed. So um, <laughs> I don't have a boss to, you know, cut me off. I don't have to experience the consequences in the same way. Um, but it can also mean that maybe the door doesn't open for me and I don't get into the space at all. Uh, and um, I, I love the answer. Well, one of the things that triggered the question is because you'd, you'd said in the presentation, um, the realization that no one was coming to save us or that group. And it, it could be, I was trying to understand if it was related more to the pandemic and keeping the doors open from an economic standpoint, or is it more from a holistic community spiritual standpoint? And maybe it's one and the same, but your answer just on kind of the doors open, the roadblocks helped that. But your point was well taken. You said no one was coming mm -hmm. to save us. And I was like, mm -hmm. what did that, in well, your, what did that well, mean? Actually, let's talk about the financial position of it as well. A lot of businesses, um, especially small businesses, cease to exist um, now after these past couple of years. Um, opening and closing your business over and over again has a lot of financial costs, right? Um, another thing that I found was while um, you'd hear on the news, there's access to this business fund and this grant and that sort of thing. Many of those things had like Rubik's cubes in front of them. If you didn't have an accountant, if you didn't have somebody who understood finances, it was very difficult to actually access that money. So many people were starting off with fresh ideas from the very beginning. And you know, new ideas don't always necessarily generate income right away. So while we did see, I think even there was like a report that came out a few months ago that a lot of the monies from the government went to people outside of the provinces, right? Um, a lot of the money went to people who just had those resources at a drop of a dime. Like I have an amazing accountant who knows how to navigate through this so I can get $60,000. But let's say you didn't have a good accountant or let's say you didn't have an accountant at all. <laughs> I personally, as a small business, I applied for grants and I was denied over and over and over again. And then I had to employ somebody to submit for those grants and they were denied as well. So not only now have I spent all this time applying, I've paid somebody and they haven't gotten it either. And that's not a unique right situation for me. Now I'm lucky in that like it ended up working out for me and that my business still exists and that I had other things to pivot to. Um, but that is not the case for everybody. So I would say from a financial um, position that a lot of people have had to start again and have lost their businesses altogether during this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Julian for that question. And I hope that wasn't too <laughs> Hope I didn't make everybody cry in here. Does anybody else have any questions or comments even? Questions for each other? Maybe you see somebody in here you wanna. Okay, I see Juanita. Hi, Juanita. You hey. can add mic. Yes. Um, hey, thanks so much for, um, yeah, the presentation. I came for the last bit of it. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, about as someone that's in the wellness space about the concept of black excellence um, and your thoughts on it. 
Um, I personally think that the idea of Black excellence is quite problematic. The idea that we can only feel happy and can only feel, um, you know, joy and we're not allowed to make mistakes. We're not allowed to mm. basically, you know, um, be human as a result of, you know, all the different stereotypes that come with being Black. So I wanted to get a sense from you how to balance that reality with, you know, being in a Black body and also taking care of yourself and what that means. Mm. Okay. I like this question. And I struggle with it as well. Uh, my parents are from uh, the Caribbean. I'm first generation. Uh, so if you share in that experience, you know that your parents probably made a lot of sacrifices for you to be in this country and they want you to participate in absolutely everything <laughs> and get absolutely everything right and be the top of your class. I remember when I was younger and I would get like, let's say 90% on a test and my dad would be like, where's the, where's the 10%? Where's the missing 10%? <laughs> like, where's the room for us to be just who we are? Um, and I think, I think that narrative probably came and started out from a good place, right? Trying to debunk the idea that we are not subhuman, um, that we are just as amazing as everybody else. I'm not sure exactly who started it. I want to say it might've been a black person, <laughs> um, but what I would say is like the excellence needs to come from within me. My, my perspective of what excellent is, is the one that's important. Sometimes excellent just means getting out of the bed today because I had a really tough day, you know? Sometimes it means like getting to work on time. <laughs> like that is excellent for me. I think it's important to live within your best self as much as you can right? Like, what are your limits? What's important to you? Not what everybody else places on you. Because if I ask the room what excellence is to you, we all have different definitions. So how can I possibly be the most excellent to everybody in this space? So for me, it's about like, okay, I know what I set out to do. I know what my intentions are. I know what my goalpost is. And I like to spend a lot of time in meditation so that I can hear what my voice sounds like. I'm sure that you might have done something in your life where you're like, wait a minute, whose idea was that? Like, is this something I want for myself? <laughs> or did somebody tell me to do this? You know, we ask like seven-year-olds, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then now this poor seven-year-old is locked into being a lawyer because somebody told them <laughs> at seven. <laughs> right? So to me, it's like, okay, how can I spend time hearing my own voice, evaluating the experiences I ha I'm having and saying like, I want to do that again, or that doesn't actually align with who I am. And I think once we, you can like find that space, then you can determine what excellent is for you. And when you want to activate your excellence, right? Because you don't need to be excellent 100% of the time. You are a human being. But um, that's kind of how I navigate around it. I'm still making plenty mistakes. Um, and I'd like to hear how other people are navigating around pressures of excellence or performance, if they have any. I'll jump in. I just sometimes feel like it becomes a bit of a marketing slogan. For, for, and I'm a marketer, so I, I don't want to dump on my own profession, but it does become a bit of a, a, a almost a, a campaign theme. And I think there's pros and cons to it because it may mean different things for different people at different stages. But your point is uh, amazing, Allison, about just your inner voice and knowing where your goalposts are, because I think personally that just helps. That's how I approach it without, you know, consciously or subconsciously. You know, I, I, I find solace in just knowing kind of what I can do and putting my head down at night and saying, okay, that's it for today and let's see what happens tomorrow. So, but, um, but I do think it is um, a, a challenging question. I think Juanita asked an amazing question because there's a lot of layers to it. 
Hi, kind of. Um, hi, Justin Senior here. Thanks so much for being here. This is awesome. Um, hi, Anita. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question because I think you you kind of sometimes you're in the weeds and you're not really thinking about it in that way, but you know that there's pressure on you, whether it's coming from yourself or from the outside world. You know, maybe it's a facade. Maybe it is just all the pressure that you're putting on yourself. And um, I know I constantly hear my parents' voices and a lot of in my head, sort of reflecting on my progress, giving me progress reports. We had a lot of uh, we were big at the dinner table for setting goals, and mm -hmm. at Thanksgiving we would talk about how we we're feeling about those goals. Are we mm -hmm. on path to it? It would be absolutely terrifying as like high school student with bad grades, knowing <laughs> that you had to talk about those things. And so, like, there was pressure along the way. I know why the pressure was there, but you know, it was all positive for from for for all of us kids. But like, you know, you hear things go on in the community and someone does something terrible and it's almost like you're carrying the weight for your entire community so for me in this industry going into a new role in a very big place and I'm still building out my my community and knowing where people are and what everyone does it's it can be um, fascinating when I do find a place to pause and just to see like wait I think I know everyone now and I feel like I'm finding some rhythm, but is there anyone I forgot about? Is there something that I'm, am I doing enough for my community here? Am I, am I doing enough? And I think that's, I, I can't tell if that's my voice or if that's just, you know, the industry in general, because it's more about, you know, a lot of it's urgent matters, but a lot of the work I'm in my workplace to do is important work. So, you know, it, the, the timing and the pacing of things is still sort of like, which one comes first and, um, I know which one I'm always going to, what lane I'm always going to lean on, but yeah, it's just a pressure thing that it's kind of, I don't know if it's me. Okay. That's a good perspective. And it's probably a little bit your parents too. <laughs> 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 I want to blame your parents today. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do see all those diplomas behind you, so I know it's uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to I should blur these things out. These aren't even mine, these are my wives. <laughs> Y'all can't see that angle, but that was me. That was we're good. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Okay, well, we're almost at the two o'clock mark. Um, so this is just where I drop how you can find me. Um, our organization is always looking for support. We're always looking for people who align with our values. If you know how to comb hair, if you're a hairstylist, pull up. Um, if you want to run, if you want to teach yoga, if you know an organization that wants to support um, some of these initiatives so that the women can participate in camp for free, self-defense courses for free, running classes for free, um, you know where to find me. And I did have one question for you yes. though. Um, what, like, where does Allison Hill in you know the next couple of years? Like, are you seeing a ton of these opportunities popping up? Are people asking you consistently to speak? Are you seeing those doors continue to open? What, what does it feel like right now? So, I I love talking. Um, I was the kid that my my teacher would put me in a desk in the corner because I would just would not stop talking. <laughs> uh, but what I have found is I kind of approach um, my speaking and the way I present myself to the world as if I don't have something um, to say or sell, I kind of keep it to myself. And right now the initiative that I am pushing with this salon is opening up space for black women to feel well. We've partnered with UFT to research our program over the next year um, through surveys, questionnaires, being in person. I want to know what some of those barriers are to women accessing wellness for themselves. Um, because in the long term, 
I would like to have a space and an organization that focuses on that from a scientific, a cultural um, perspective. So for me right now, it's kind of like keeping my eye on the prize and um, I am, I am uh, privileged in that this is a community where I can also take care of myself. And um, when we started, it was like just a little snowball. Now I feel like I've, I'm in the snowball and I'm going down the hill with everybody else. So um, all the opportunities to talk about what's happening, how we can make changes for more equitable spaces. Uh, that's what I'm really excited about doing. On behalf of NABS and POCAM, Allison, thank you for today. What a treat. I'm so glad we recorded it because we're going to share it um, with all our communities after this. And I'd love to have you back um, to uh, do another session because I know there's so many people that really wanted to be here today and schedules just uh, didn't permit it. So we'd love to have you and your energy back with us again Thank soon. You. Thank I'd love you. To be back. Thanks everybody for Thank joining. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you have so much. Have a wonderful day. And I'm giving you the rest of the afternoon off. Great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Thank you, everybody. That's it. I'm out of there. <laughs> Good afternoon off. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.